If you like what we do here over at Aircrew Interview and would like to see the channel to carry on growing, there's a couple of ways you can help us out. The first is by going to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can help us out for as little as $1 per month. The site shows how we spend our money and where we spend our money and also the tiers we offer. The other is by going to aircrewinterview.tv forward slash donate where you can donate as little or as much as you want. And every penny does go into the channel and it really does help. So thank you in advance. Enjoy. So, Jeff, can you t tell us when you first heard about Red Flag? Um, so I, I started pilot training in 1978 and really knew nothing about the wider Air Force. Uh, I, I got assigned an F-111 out of the blue right in uh, 1979. Still really didn't know uh, much about anything. And I, so I first heard about Red Flag in uh, what about probably October of 79 as a, as a real thing because a squadron I was in was going to go to Red Flag in I think February of 1980. Mm -hmm. So that was the first I'd heard about it. I was like, okay, what's this thing? And there was uh, some debate in the squadron at the time about uh, there was one other uh, second lieutenant and I and we were the only aircraft commanders, the, the left seaters on the base who were second lieutenants because up until then everybody had to have a thousand hours or more. Mm -hmm. So you had these two butter bars who were kind of sitting out there going, well, now what do we do with them? Can't take these idiots, they're too new. But on the other hand, the whole squadron's going. So ultimately we got to go. Mm -hmm. We did get to go. Uh, Red Flag had only been in existence at that point since about 1975. And it came about uh, because of the Vietnam War that we had, uh, it originally came about because our uh, margin of air-to-air -air superiority over the North Vietnamese was not nearly what we thought it should be. And the reasons were that uh, the institutional air force, and really I think the Navy too, had decided that we had these missiles that we could just shoot and the missiles would do the work. So we didn't need to do all this training and air combat maneuvering and all this other stuff. Um, and so as a consequence, the Air Force created Red Flag to provide realistic adversary training, that they had adversary units that, that were resident there, the uh, aggressors, and uh, then guest units would come in and they'd have about on a four, four. Anyway, that's how Red Flag got started. Mm -hmm. It's primarily to improve air to air and and then over pretty quickly became a a, a scenario driven exercise. Mm -hmm. And so the by the time I got there it was pretty much in what was its uh, mature phase that lasted until uh, probably the f end of the Soviet Empire, mm -hmm. when everything changed. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit about why you were selected? Well, I, the whole squadron went. I, I don't know, I have, nobody ever talked to me about these things. Um, they, the squadron went, and everybody in the squadron went. And I think the squadron deployed for a month, and they kind of split the squadron into two halves. And so, I was going the second week, the second two weeks, and um, so I, I remember at a, uh, the, during the first two weeks we needed some radar parts to Nellis, get sent to Nellis. And so, pointed at me, I guess I was just hanging around, the, you know, and I said, you know, line of sight scheduling, you, uh, we need you to fly an airplane with some radar parts in the weapons bay to Nellis. Okay. I'll do that. So we did a low level en route <coughs> up through the uh, Four Corners region, just beautiful, empty, just spectacular place. I wish that we had GoPro cameras back then mm. because that was really, anyway, we pop up out of the low level and get up to uh, 16,500 feet, which is the highest we could go legally VFR and try to get in contact with center. And well, none of the frequencies you had worked. Well, now what do we do? Well, I see the Colorado River down there and go, oh, 
So Colorado River, that goes to Hoover Dam, and Hoover Dam over there is, I know, we'll just follow the river. And we flew right down the Grand Canyon before that was illegal. Mm. That was to be real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so when you put the wings all, we put the wings all the way out, flaps and slats down, went really slow, cruised down there. Anyway, so we showed up at uh, Nellis in a completely bizarre direction because nobody really told us anything and deliver, delivered our parts and went home that same afternoon. So one of my biggest memories of Red Flag initially is just delivering some radar parts. Um, anyway, so we just divided the squadron in half uh, and then went in sequen sequential two-week periods. Um, the, the thing that when you asked me to, to do this, it, uh, kind of struck me, and I'm going to try and not make this boring, is how different the world is now than it was then. And I haven't really thought about it that much. I just, okay, that's, but when I started thinking about the scenario we trained for, the equipment we were using, the, everything is different now. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. There, there are seriously, there is practically nothing that you could point to other than you push the throttle forward and the airplane goes faster. That part's the same. Mm. You know, the stick throttle, but really everything else has drastically changed. And I couldn't even begin to tell you what red flag scenarios are like now. Mm -hmm. um, when we went, there was no such thing as stealth. Uh, and the only really thing that approximated stealth were airplanes like the A6 and the F-111 that could go low altitude at night because that was kind of stealthy. They couldn't they couldn't see you really or not for long enough to shoot at you so so that was the equivalent of stealth everything was analog we pulled maps paper maps out and drew lines on them with pens uh, we used stopwatches and compasses to do dead reckoning to back up the inertial navigation systems which were not very reliable the weapons were completely unguided um, so everything had to be done by putting the airplane in the proper position so that when the weapon came off the airplane, its vector was such that it would hit the target. Nobody does that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's completely changed. The, so the force structure's changed. The scenario is undoubtedly different now. We don't, we don't really have a peer uh, competitor. The Chinese Air Force and the Russian Air Force are they're really, um, they have kind of semi peer capable equipment, but they have no idea really how to control it. They don't have any AWACS, they don't have the in depth uh, experience with uh, command and control that we do. And so it would really be their efforts against us would be very piecemeal, I think. So, anyway, it's just completely uh, because we don't have a peer competitor that would make it all different. And um, so anyway, that just kind of occurred to me that I, I'd be talking about kind of like a, a life that probably a lot of the viewers don't know about except in history books. Exactly, yeah. So let's talk about your first exercise over there. What was the squadron were you with, uh, were you with and it, what aircraft were you with? It was a 522nd uh, fighter squadron out of Cannon. A Cannon at the time had three squadrons. Uh, there were two of them that did RT replacement training unit stuff. One of them, uh, uh, 524th, they were primarily involved in training people to go to Lake and Heath, and then the 41st uh, trained guys that were staying in the States. 522nd was a, the uh, fighting fireballs, uh, and we were the one operational squad, and that's why because at that point as an operational guy, that's how I, you know, that's why I run the squadron that got to go. The, and the airplane was the F-111D, which was probably the most technically advanced airplane in the world at the time. Oh, really? It was a uh, full glass cockpit, uh, inertial, uh, uh, digital inertial, uh, um, INS. The airplane was very, very digital. And in that regard, it was the most advanced airplane in the world. Probably the first airplane to have all those features in it. Uh, the downside is that the technology really wasn't there. It was uh, a small scale integration, so the giant circuit boards with lots and lots of parts. 
And when you get that many parts, even a small failure rate means things break all the time. And so uh, when I first got to Canon, there were half the ramp had airplanes without engines in them because the engines were coming apart. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get that fixed for a long time. And then you'd look in the you'd look in the cockpit of those airplanes, and there'd be holes in the instrument panel because they had cannibalized all the parts because we didn't have parts. And so there were, there were real issues with that airplane. It was uh, way too. And I'm getting off topic here. But the F-111D was at that time most. Oh, we also had a, a HUD had a heads-up display. We might have been. I think the F-15 had a HUD, mm -hmm. but I think the F-111D might have been one of the first fighters with a HUD in it. They had a moving map. We had a moving map in there. It was, it was a uh, kind of a glass plate, and it actually moved. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you saw this big kind of round display, but it wasn't like a digitized map that you'd see. It was an actual map mm -hmm. that got moved around to show where you were. It almost never worked. <laughs> kind of comical. Anyway, um, so that's the uh, squadron in the airplane. Um, and so we were always, our mission was always suppression of enemy air defense uh, to allow uh, less vulnerable or more vulnerable airplanes to come in and also to, uh, if we could take down runways, airfields and stuff like that, then we'd lessen the problem for the air-to-air uh, uh, -air guys. And that was always an issue because the threat we were facing at the time was the Soviet Union, which had huge numerical superiority. Not qualitative superiority, but certainly numerical uh, superiority over our stuff. So we, if we could keep them on the ground, then that we started solving that problem. And so that was always the 111's role, was to go in and knock down airfields or, uh, or their SAM systems or stuff like that. Uh, the, I think the one... There are many great things about Red Flag, and one of them was in addition to providing realistic training. Is in the normal world, a fighter unit has its own base and it operates out of its own base, and all it knows is really its own problems. It doesn't have to think about how do I work with other airplanes. Well, if you bring a whole bunch of airplanes to um, and different airplanes to a single base, now one of your biggest problems is just getting off the ground. Because mm -hmm. now you have to get, you got to worry about your time over target, you got to have, it, you conflict the airspace, you got to have airplanes getting out to where they need to be, you're, you're forming this whole uh, giant mission in a, what turned out to be uh, later on in Desert Storm, that, that was fundamental to some of the operations we did in Desert Storm. Really the first time out in like Turkey, we had a combined wing. It was like red flag all over again. And we knew how to do this because almost everybody there had done it before. And so we could do it very, very effectively. If, we'd have been, if we didn't have something like red flag, uh, the combined force up at Inzalik would have been probably been combat ineffective because so we're just essential then. Well, yeah, because we, we I don't think we thought we were doing what was going to be realistic training because most of our uh, our forces in in Europe were uh, unique. You know, F-111s at at uh, Upper Hayford, F-15s at Schusterberg, F-4s at Alkenbury. You know, we were all, and then we would all, you know, just some co coordinated kind of attack plan, but we'd all be our own little elements of it, not having to work really particularly with anyone else. Yeah. And so Red Flag actually was outstanding preparation for that. Now the way a, a typical Red Flag day went is we'd get, the units would get an air tasking order. And that would task us with the targets and the weapons and the assets for that day's mission. And then you'd have a, uh, a flight lead from each, and we were probably putting up, I think we were putting up eight, I don't say about eight airplanes wow. per, per mission. I think we put, took 12 out there and then had a few spares because those airplanes broke all the time. So I think we we're doing about eight per mission. And so we'd have our, whatever, our, one of our flight leads would go out. And so 
all the flight leads would meet with whoever the designated mission commander would be. And frequently, the mission commander would be one of the air-to-ground guys because kind of fundamentally, if you think about it, air-to-air -air is a support role. Yeah. It's there are layers of support. The, the core of the problem is defeating the enemy on the ground. And so everything exists to support our troops on the ground. You know, the A-10s are kind of your very first layer of support, and then you work your way back to, you know, so the F-111s are probably three or four layers of support away, because now we're trying to, we're going deep in enemy territory to make life in the future easier for the guys on the ground. And then the F-15s are up there, you know, supporting us to keep enemy air off us. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, because we were often the point of the mission, you don't just send up fighters to just drill holes in the sky. They're always doing it for a reason, and some re it's some reason beyond them. So the air ground guys would be mission commander, and then we would, so at that time, I, their first red flag, I don't think we had AWACS. I don't think that existed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, I'm already preparing myself for this, that my memory, this, we're talking now, what, 40 years ago? Near as damn it. <laughs> um, so my memory is not going to be real accurate. And so I may say things that uh, I've, aren't necessarily true just because I don't remember them very well. Apologize in advance. Um, so we would get, if we had any, you know, we had air refueling that had to be done, we'd have to marshal up with the tankers, we didn't have, and it was a little bit simpler then. We had air to air and air to ground. We didn't have any EF 111s then. I don't think we had AWACS then. So now we're just having several different types of air to ground assets, the A7s. No, I think we had Navy there, so we had A7s, A4s maybe, F-111s, A6s. I think the Navy had EA6s at that time. Anyway, uh, so we'd coordinate the ECM stuff we had, and the, we'd come up with different routes into the target area because you're trying to keep the enemy off balance. So uh, we'd sit down and say, okay, you guys go here and you guys go here, and it's almost like laying out a football, uh, American football play with all the X's and O's and all that stuff. And then we'd arrange timing because you'd want your time over target to be very compressed to saturate the air defenses. So we'd get all that stuff settled out and then we'd also uh, get settled out how we were, who would tax, you know, what the taxi routes are going to be, what time you're starting, what order you're taxiing in. Uh, typically the 111s would taxi first because we had a lot of gas and we could make it we didn't have anywhere near the fuel constraints that the other airplanes did. <clears throat> We'd have to find a place. We'd take taxi first, then find a place to hold. Then we'd depart a hold uh, depending on what route we were taking, whether we were coming around the north, which we often did, because we had the range to do a longer, and that would spread them out. Um, and then there was a lot, so there was a lot of planning in getting us sequenced off the base just to get ready to go. So that would be, that would probably take, I don't know, four, five hours mission planning. Then we go out and do the mission, which itself for us would take about two, mm. right around two hours. And the missions would involve, uh, for us, typically, uh, like I said, go out to a holding pattern, get our push time, and then descend to low altitude, uh, keeping below the, the uh, the radar that, uh, and I think they might have even had some radar sites. I know they had some, what they developed, what they called Smoky Sam ranges, where we would, they would have ranges where they had threat radars and then they would launch, they were just smoke, smoky rockets, they call them Smoky Sam, to so give you an, a sense of what a surf, you know, okay, that they launched this because they got a lock on me and not long enough to do one. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so then we'd be, uh, We'd ingress into the target area in typically two ship uh, formations. We'd, we'd take off as flights of four and then split up. Uh, once we got to the hold, then we'd kind of split up into two pairs of two. We could, we could do four ship tax spread. And sometimes we did a really uh, tactical formation is a way where you can 
have a defensive formation that is you can maneuver and uh, not talk to each other. And you do that by using geometry. So if, say, we're coming up to a 45 degree turn, the guy on the outside of the turn is going to turn first. And then he's going to play his turn so that you roll out. And, and depending on the degree of the turn, you might take, like if it's a 90, you'll take a cutoff and then you roll out. And I, it's, but you're always keyed on lead. And so if leads, leads make the turn, if he's doing a 90, he'll break away, I think it was 45 degrees, and roll out, and you turn hard, and you come across, and then he rolls out, and, you, and you want, you're aiming to be about six to 9,000 feet apart. And the goal there, there's two goals. One of them is uh, the 111 had uh, not very good visibility out the back. So if you got that far apart, then guys could they could check the other guy's six. So that'd be one reason to do it. And the other one is, is that if the if a air to air guy comes in, he might miss the other guy. And so if this guy you saw, hey, you got, you know, you got red air coming in at left left seven o'clock, nine thousand feet, he'd push it up. He might turn away as a smart one eleven guy, put speed on, and then and then I might put myself into his face, now even for, that's going to give him angles he can't solve. So he's probably going to have to honor that and break off. Or if it goes the other way, like if the guy was coming over me, didn't see me, he turns away, I'm in behind the guy, boom, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So it, it offers uh, a, some mutual support in addition to being able to uh, provide visual cover, uh, just look out for the other guy. So we, we deploy as... Uh, We'd ingress into the target typically in pairs. Uh, our weapons at the time, and I hope I'm not getting, the detail might get a little bit much here. We did not have good weapons for the airplane in the early, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the only weapon that was suitable for the speed of the airplane was a Mark 84 uh, low drag weapon which we could carry as fast as the airplane could go. Very low drag and a lot of, it's 2,000 pounds, so a lot of punch if it hit anything. Um, the downside was there was no way to retard it because we couldn't, there weren't fins that would slow the thing enough once it came off the airplane. If you don't create separation between you and the weapon, the weapon's gonna blow you out of the sky. Mm. When it goes, its frag's gonna get you. So we had our tactics would be driven by a weapon that really wasn't, if we delivered it level, then we had to, we'd come in at low altitude. They popped up, I think we had delivered at 1,000 feet uh, in order to not get hit by the frag if we did a level delivery, which was really the only delivery. Remember, we're a night fighter, so that's the only delivery that's really suitable for us at night. All the red flags are during the day. So now we're doing tactics that aren't, really compatible with uh, our employment scheme. A lot of fun, but <laughs> not really compatible. Anyway, so our tactics were uh, typically either a level delivery with uh, Mark 84 weapons. We could go lower with the, the Mark 82 500 pounder had fins that popped out to slow it down. Uh, we had to slow down to deliver that weapon, otherwise we'd rip the fins off and then get blown up. Um, or we would do uh, pop to uh, low angle bomb, where you'd, let's say, that's the target, and come in, might come in this direction, and then we wanted to get impact angle and escape from the weapon and be a dynamic target in order to avoid getting shot. So you'd pull up to about 30 degrees nose high, go pretty much full afterburner, get about three, 4,000 feet apart target, roll over about 120 degrees bank, roll out, track, 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 drop, and go. Very, very manual. Mm -hmm. Really, no, nothing guided about that. It's all, all feel, fair amount of luck. Uh, and so that's our, our tactics would go. And then we'd reform and hopefully we'd be reforming uh, in some sort of tax spread on the way out. Mostly that didn't happen. Because mm -hmm. by now things are just too dynamic and we're just getting the hell out of Dodge as fast as we can go. And, uh, we would be 
the the range, red flag ranges to the east uh, were subsonic, to the west, and if uh, and I wish I had maps, it'd be a little bit easier to depict. Uh, Area 51 is where Dreamland is. That's that's the super secret area nobody's allowed in. That's kind of the southern. That's like the southern edge of the red flag range is roughly centered. So north and west of 51 was supersonic, east was subsonic, and so and most of our targets were on the west side of the red flag ranges. So we'd coming out of the range, uh, we'd be then going as fast as we could go, which pretty much made us invulnerable. And then our our um, now we're burning fuel at 40, 80,000 pounds an hour, I think 40,000 pounds an hour and en per engine to be going that fast. And the fastest I saw on the deck, I think of that red flag was 963 knots, which that it was like, I, I was, there, the world low altitude speed record, I think is, I, I think it might be held by an F-104. That's because that's, that's just what they bothered to measure. Mm. 111 speed Not gonna that all the time. There was no, I don't think there's any airplane in the world that went faster than we did. Mm -hmm. um, F-111 had more grunt, so, but anyway, you keep one eye on your fuel quantity gauge because you can just see the thing rolling down. And we had a, a burners out fuel because if you left the burners on too long, just, I mean, 30 seconds, you could have real situation on your hand because you're burning fuel so fast you know the 30 seconds of fuel at, at low altitude might be 15 minutes of fuel or no, it might 80,000 pounds an hour we burn 12 about six 30 seconds on the deck is six seven minutes at altitude and did you get a warning in the cockpit or was it literally no, no, you just no, had to yeah you had to look it. I'd keep an look. eye on it yeah. so a little bit of a embarrassing red flag story here so this is my first mission we did a pop to low angle bomb on a airfield SA-6 target. Now we're coming out. Um, I, I'm pretty certain there are some horses, uh, wild horses out there that I was the last thing they ever heard. PETA um, might be out after me now, have uh, a contract on me for that. Because we didn't perhaps obey minimum altitudes as much as we might have done, if you know what I'm saying. And um, blew right through some F4 and an A10 having at each other. I mean, they were like right through the center of their fight. It was kind of cool. And then I hit burners out fuel. Now, for those of you uh, who have a grasp in the obvious, you'll already know this without me telling you, but when an airplane is no longer accelerating, that means the thrust that's pushing it has equaled the drag so that there's no difference anymore, okay? So at full grunt in that, so there's about 60,000 pounds of push, and there's 60,000 pounds of one direction of air pushing the other, effectively. Okay, now, if you are not keyed into the readily apparent, and you go, you take your throttles, and go from full afterburner to mill power, you've taken about 30,000 pounds of push off the airplane. Well, guess what? That 30,000 pounds, of, there, there's 30,000 pounds of drag that has nothing better to do than slow you down. It was like hitting a freaking wall. <laughs> but seriously, it was, it was, there are traffic accidents that aren't, that aren't as brutal as that. We had, the 111 had, um, uh, kind of a stowage, a uh, pub stowage area right here. And we didn't have the little straps on because who needs them? You're never going to slow down that much. All of our pubs went straight mm. all the way to the front, uh, all the way to the front of the cockpit. And well, well the F-111 windscreen, man, that's, that's four feet away. And they're all jammed up there. All this, this pile of white paper is just, just jammed up there. We're, I guess we're not going to need those. And my, uh, my Wizzo, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, they put me with a really senior Wizzo, he just, he just turned and looked at me. Didn't move, his, just looked at me. And you could tell behind his visor, that he's going, oh my God, this is the stupidest person I've ever seen in my life. So, 
that's one of my red flag memorable moments was jamming all our pubs up at the front of the front of the windscreen. <laughs> um, and then it was, then you recover, get all the airplane shot. And the, another interesting, kind of interesting thing about red flag, it would never happen anywhere else. Uh, it was during the day uh, that you, if you saw an airplane, you just joined on them. You, know, you, you might not beat them. I, I may be joining on an F-4, uh, you know, A-6, whatever it was, because if you got into formation, then that solved traffic, a lot of traffic problems because you can get, you get two, three, four guys that come down initial same time, boom, boom, boom. You know, you, you can really get airplanes in in a big freaking hurry. I wonder if that happens these days. Or... I don't, again, I have no idea. Mm. I don't really know. I, they don't do, I don't think they do any low level anymore. Mm. Now, maybe, you know, the F-15E is a, was a replacement for the 111, so it has a low level capability. I have no idea if they employ it that way. Um, but we don't have, it, the reason you fly low level is to avoid a threat. And stealth airplanes only increase their threat if they go low level. So there's no reason for an F-22, F-35. They also, they're kind of stuck flying at night too. It's a weird thing. We don't, I'm not sure how much of a day Air Force we have anymore. Mm -hmm. But again, now, now there are people who are, you know, they're in the Air Force now or have, you know, I've been retired since 2000. Stopped flying operationally in 1992. So it gives you an idea how far removed I, and, and you think of all the changes that have happened since. And if, you know, F-117 is out of service by now. Yeah. You know, that's a thing that came and went and we've gone beyond that. So I don't. I really don't know what the scenarios are like because they don't have a low-level mission anymore. Don't have a peer. Really have a peer competitor. We probably, uh, you know, they probably do aggressors that using Chinese or or Russian tactics and simulated equipment. But I mean, if your enemy is ISIS, hmm. you know, that's kind of how do you train for that? So I'm pretty certain we're training for the most capable competitor. Uh, not necessarily the one we're most likely to face. And, I, and, and really, at some point, you don't have a choice except to do that. Uh, anyway, so I, don't have, I have no idea how they're working that now. It's just, that cut just kind of shows that there's this whole element to red flag that's kind of gone. What do you have there? You know, the B1B, make, it can go level level. Mm -hmm. But they probably do standoff stuff because well, all the weapons now are, you know, they're, they're either laser guided or more likely, they you program coordinates in them and go, okay, see ya. Perhaps a tornado, I think that's probably the closest. Yeah, the tornado, well, that, isn't the tornado going away? The, the British one is, I'm not sure about the Italians. Uh, oh, the oh yeah, I don't know about, yeah, okay, I don't know about those. Non-stealth airplanes kind of have to go low level, but the I think the missiles now have gotten so capable that even uh, even low level isn't, I'm not, I'm not sure that's really getting you away from the threat. Yeah. And with the standoff weapons now, where you can, um, you know, stand off. I think a B fifty two, B fifty twos do close air support for Pete's sake. Who would have thought of that? <laughs> That's you crazy. Know, and they do it? that, but they orbit, you know, thirty six thousand feet, and they're probably you get twenty miles of range on a weapon from thirty six thousand feet. Yeah, there, and the other reason we did low levels to get kind of get closer to your work, you get better results. You're not going to, if you have unguided weapons, you're not going to hit anything from, you're not going to hit what you're aiming at from. 10 miles out or, or 20,000 feet up if you're anything like a point target. If, you, if you're low level, well, you can get pretty, get pretty good results if you're dropping from 400 feet, which mm -hmm. is what, what we did in, we had weapons later on that were developed uh, that what suited the F-111. And then we're, now we're dropping at 400 feet and slant range as a target are so small at that point that you can get really pretty mm -hmm. good. Anyway, so that's how the, so now we've, gotten out there, hit the target, gotten back, maybe got shot along the way, maybe not. Um, uh, maybe shot somebody, hopefully. Didn't happen a, much, a bunch, but it did. Uh, and uh, the recovery was different from what we do anywhere else. And then we got into the debrief. And a lot of the debrief would involve, okay, here's how we could have had the ground plan better. You know, what did people get to the, do you have any, anybody end up in Area 51? 
I know a tornado got, uh, did that. One. Oh yeah, I, I think every red flag had one or two guys that ended up there, and mm -hmm. and part of the reason for that was because you, you knew the enemy air couldn't come from that side, so you used it as a wall, and you'd run your low levels right up along the north side of Area 51. Well. You know, if an air-to-air -air guy comes from the right side and somebody breaks, the moment they break left, boom, they're in Area 51. I think we had one of the guys in my squadron show up, get, get uh, tagged for that when I was down there. <laughs> um, and then, so, and then, so they, that the part of the debrief chart didn't go too long. Then the air-to-air -air guys got up and, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. There's nothing. Air-to-air the -air debriefs are just an endless flurry of buzzwords and mostly and, a, a, and a, if the air-to-air -air guys think I'm making a little fun of them it's because I am um, a, a flurry of buzzwords and really what it boiled down to is the fight was one in the debrief it wasn't one in that out in the air it was one in the debrief well that changed uh, I actually got the red flag twice uh, once when I was uh, at, at uh, Cannon and then the second time was in about 89, 1989. We deployed, I was uh, my second tour at Upper Hayford at the 79th Fighter Squadron. Um, and uh, we, we uh, my, our squadron went out to Red Flag. Uh, and um, by that time, they had what is called the RFMDS, a Red Flag Mission Data System. And every airplane carried one, it was probably about, you know, about this long, this big around, and it, it, had, uh, it had a transponder in it that reported the airplane's location, altitude, speed, heading, and ID. And that all got broadcast back to the red flag mission control, and so they could replay the whole mission. Every airplane, what it all did, and suddenly the debriefs got shorter in the air-to-air -air guys because they couldn't lie anymore. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> so, like, talking about the air-to-air -air guys, uh, what uh, aircraft would uh, you go up against? What would be your threat? Well, let's see. We, I think we went up against, well, they had, the aggressors were at that time were F-5s. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that was definitely, so we saw F-5s. That airplane is really hard to see. Not very big. Uh, well, it's the basic size. It's a T-38, essentially. So, very di difficult airplane to see. A little bit limited in terms of uh, performance. They really, I don't, I don't think a T-38, uh, F-5 could go faster than about 450 on the deck. And that yeah, was like, we, you know, we were snoozing at 550. So, it's really hard to do an intercept on an airplane that's already got 70 knots going away on you. And if you don't get a perfect solution, then the missile you're shooting has to bridge the gap between, and so a missile has a certain amount of kinematic range, and on a receding target, it you have to be shoot, you have to get closer to not exceed that range for a target that's receding from you, and so the V that's what's called V sub C V closure, and so if you have 70, 100 knots of of uh, undertake, if that that's if he's falling behind you at 80 knots, then his, visa, his kinematic range is a lot shorter, a lot harder for him to get a shot. So hard to convert, hard to get a shot off. Mm -hmm. And that's especially true with um, uh, heaters because uh, uh, heat-seeking missiles are small. They're kind of built for close-in stuff. They were the only uh, weapons at the time that were effective against us because radar, uh, radars couldn't pick us out against, area radars couldn't pick us out against ground clutter until the F-15 showed up. Mm. And so by, I think even by the early, uh, by the late 80s, still there weren't very many weapons that could get us down low. Um, so if you combine the short range and the difficulty of making an intercept, the F-5s had a, had a kind of a tough time against us. The F-15s could be coast speed uh, if it was in a subsonic range. If it was supersonic, there was no way. So things had changed by the time we got to the second red flag. Now we're, the red flag mission data system is uh, giving everybody a depiction of what actually happened. And so you could watch, you, could, you really, really got a lot more out of it. And was that accurate? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I don't think, they didn't have GPS at the time. 
I don't think they did. I don't think, think GPS was a thing yet in yeah. 1989. Again, talking about how the world's changed. Yeah. No, actually, no, it was. It was. I take that back. We had, we, I think in 1990, we got our first uh, updated F-111s that had uh, replaced the analog flight computers with digital flight computers, gave us a mission control display unit, uh, digital INS, and a um, GPS. Okay. So that was 19. So I guess we probably did have GPS on mm -hmm. at the time. But that's really, and we only got about two of those airplanes, and then the Soviet Union gave it up, and then we're like, damn it, finally got this airplane right, and these guys quit. I swear we should have, that was such a good gig, you know, for the pilots. We should have just been shoveling money under the wall just to keep them going. Mm. Well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> Red Flag was started to ensure that our air to air guys were properly trained and familiar with. Uh, air combat, advanced air combat maneuvering against their competitors. So it started out as an air-to-air -air thing, and I think the Air Force has had an institutional mindset that has, it, it's really been all about air-to-air, -air, and I'm not sure the Air Forces really understand that air-to-air -air is a support mission. I, why do they keep trying to cancel the A-10? I don't get that editorial comment. Uh, so I don't think they, at some level, the institution of the Air Force is just, they're so shiny, glittery air-to-air -air machines. And so we didn't, we did day red flags. Mm -hmm. But you have airplanes out there that aren't going to employ during the day. And they're employing, and they're going to red flag, practicing tactics they will never use. You can't do tact formation at night. Mm -hmm. You can't do pop the low angle bomb at night. You have to do other tactics. You have to, and if you don't, if you're not using those tactics, then you're not highlighting the fact that you don't have the weapons that you need to do the tactics that you're supposed to have to employ the frickin' airplane in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we went so long. Uh, the airplane had been in service since the early 60s. Here it is, nine, you know, the airplane had been in service 15 years. Mm -hmm. Still didn't have suitable weapons for it. They did do a one night red flag when I was there. I think it was my first, I'm, Pretty certain it was my first time, and in in, so this is 1980 again, sorry. And they did one night red flag, air to air, might as well not even shown up. And that was the last one. They just didn't do it anymore because it failed to glorify air to air. A little sarcastic, but you, I, you can sort of, okay, well, you don't want to have an exercise where half the team really can't play. But on the other hand, we didn't employ the other half of the team the way it should have been employed. Mm -hmm. So that was some. That was really some unrealistic training. It did lead, could have led to some serious problems later on, mm. uh, which I think the one I talked about my experiences in Desert Storm. I think I described what some of those were that we didn't. That, that if we didn't have time to get mm. fully trained, uh, if we'd had some lead in time, mm -hmm. we'd have been completely combat and effective. Um, so the the second red flag I went to was uh, different in that we had now the F-15s were a lot of them. And they had Doppler radar, and we couldn't sneak by them anymore. And they had capable um, radar guided missiles. Um, so that made that whole thing a lot harder for us. On the other hand, the Red Flag MDS kind of uh, exposed some of the exaggerations, perhaps. I, I remember we were coming out of. Target did happen to get joined into attack spread, and my my wingman told me F fifteen six o'clock on my on me. So we turned away from him, put him on our six, and he takes a shot from about twelve thousand feet. He's co airspeed now. Mm -hmm. Takes a shot at me. Calls me a kill repositions on to my wingman. Well, I'm thinking, no, you're flying an SA-9. That's 12,000 feet on a good day. No, actually, we, we were, sorry, we, I'm lying about this. We were supersonic rangers. So we were extending from, you're 12,000 feet in a good day and you have a, a negative V sub C. Mm -hmm. You're not, that missile didn't reach me. Mm -hmm. And so I repositioned, came in behind him and shot him at a much closer range. Well, they didn't count my kill. Because even though, well, he got you, uh, yeah, okay, the, the PK at that range is about 
but we'll give it to him because he's ear to ear and you're not. So but it was kind of funny, even though our FMDS it still was one on the debris. Like the popular kids at school. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was never I was never one of those guys. <laughs> So to sum up, like, how did the F-111 perform at Red Flag, and what did you actually get out of the exercise? Well, uh, it was, the 111 is an extremely potent low altitude uh, fighter. For the mission it performed, it was really best at kind of the deep interdiction. Uh, so it, we were hard to find uh, and hard to hit. Even if they could find us, it was, and uh, the uh, surface threats, um, because we were so low and so fast, even if they were theoretically capable against us, uh, their target acquisition time was so low, it was so short that by the time they, you know, their the target tracking radars are they're kind of looking at the world through a soda straw. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they track you and get a solution, if you're already gone, then they have that same, now they have the V sub C problem, mm -hmm. only worse, because mm -hmm. they're stationary. And if, if they get you, if they don't catch you before it's a tail chase, you're going away from the missile at, mm -hmm. you know, better part of 900 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's a, <clears throat> that's a, a fight they're not going to win. So yeah. we we're pretty hard to hit uh, with the missiles of the time. I think the SA, we we're probably competitive against the SA 6. By the time the SA 12 showed up, they're, by the late 80s, early 90s, we weren't. Uh, the threat was getting really pretty, pretty tough down there. Mm -hmm. um, we, red flag wasn't good for us because it never allowed us. We didn't. There were no exercises uh, that allowed us to employ in our environment. Yeah. And so ultimately, and I think I talked about this before, previously, is that uh, when we did get to Desert Storm, we were finding that we. We're com we had completely at sea on what should have been our bread and butter mm -hmm. because we never uh, never were allowed to use it uh, anything near like we had to operationally. Um, so in that regard, uh, Red Flag was not awfully, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, re you know to, it was, so that part was really cool. Mm -hmm. And was each time you went, was it two weeks? Uh, yeah, two weeks. I think, yeah, I would think it was two weeks both times. Mm -hmm. And how often would you fly? Was it every day? Uh, no, I think it was probably every other. And now you're really going back into it because mm -hmm. I, we, we had, I think we had eight airplanes down there. So I think we were launching eight in a mission. We had 20, we were 18 UE squadrons, so probably 24 pilots. So once every other day, once every third day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, overall you said you enjoyed it. Uh, do you have any memorable moments? Well, um, probably too many to count. <laughs> well, it really is. I, I, I think I, I think I, when I did the first of these, I talked about one of my red flag missions where the Navy decided to send us in. They needed us to be there first and along the same route they were going, mm -hmm. but in order to get the compressed TOT, we had to leave last and pass them on the way. Uh, and, and so it was pretty memorable. What mm -hmm. seemed just, it's, we were going so much faster than everybody else, like twice as fast. Mm -hmm. Really, they were doing about 450 and we were doing the better part of 900. Mm -hmm. And you just, <clears throat> you think if you're standing on the ground and see an airplane go by you at 450, 490, you think, oh, that's really fast. Well, they were going that fast, we're going by them that fast. <laughs> And uh, one of the, the, I did leave a punchline out of that story that some uh, EA-6s were doing a defensive break against Red Air, and I flew underneath. And that's where I, for, and then I forgot the punchline of the story, that, that he was at about 500 feet. I went below him because I knew he wasn't going to go down. And my shock wave gave him 180 degrees of uncommanded roll. Whoa. It, really? It did this to him, yeah. And the, the reason I know that is because at the debrief, we're back in our squadron room, this Navy guy comes in and he goes, oh, who, which one of you guys was the guy on the right? And it, it's the tone of voice that goes, everybody else in the room goes, oh, it's him. <laughs> and, and you know, you don't know how, how does this work? How do, okay, who did the, you know, oh God. <laughs> well, he wasn't mad. He just said, he, you know, at first I think, oh God, I'm in trouble. And he said, he just looks as, I have, and he, it was the two of us that were coming along. Mm -hmm. uh, the vice wing commander was in, was lead. Uh, his last mission, he said, we hit the supersonic boundary. I'm going as fast as I can. He hang on or not, don't care. 
Um, and uh, he said he had never seen anything move as fast as we were. Because wow. he was looking right at us. He's 90 degrees off. Now his, his, relative, speed, his relative speed to us is zero. Mm -hmm. And so I go underneath him at 900 knots. And I'm only a couple, you know, 300 feet away. I go right underneath him. And I'm maybe three or 400 feet away from the guy. He says, I've never seen anything move that fast in my life. Crikey, yeah. And before we wrap up, uh, what was it like working with like, other forces, like the Navy and other air forces? Um, well, the, uh, the Navy speaks a different language. So it, coming to terms with some of their, you know, it's not quite like as bad as English and American, but close. So uh, speaking different languages um, and having to deal with different aircraft capabilities, uh, I think operationally, having Red Flag made it, if we ever had to do it for real, would have made it a lot easier. Uh, but our interoperability was really reasonably good anyway. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't that tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had Aussies, Aussie F-111s there the second time, mm -hmm. maybe. Some of my 79th buddies will probably correct me on that. Uh, I, so I can't, I think we had the Aussies there the second time I was there. Brilliant. Well, Jeff, thanks very much for sharing your time at uh, Red Flag. I'm sure our viewers are going to really enjoy it. Yeah, well, uh, it's, a, it's a time long gone. I think that um, when looking back on it, I think that was the golden age. That was as good as it got, and ever since then, it's gotten harder. Um, you know, people deploy now, there's a diffuse threat. Uh, the mission we're doing isn't, I mean, if you're in that partly for the hell of it, for the fun of it, then uh, it's the mission is not mm -hmm. what it was. So I, I, I'm really, I think, privileged, A, for having done it, and then, and then B, for having been there when the doing it was as good mm -hmm. as it was ever gonna be. Well, thanks again, Jeff. Thanks.